give uh, the link or the actual video itself to classroom once I'm done. And then um, just sort of like keep in mind that the um, the stream like sometimes gets like frozen and stuck, but at least you'll see that that is there for you guys to refer back to later. All right. So taking a look at today, we're not going to take a look at the software just yet, but you guys will have seen on Classroom um, that I did post um, some files with regards to Duik. All right. This Duik installer, the DMG file, for some reason uh, for the Mac isn't working. So if you've got a Mac, I have edited the post to give you a link, and that will take you straight to uh, Rainbox Lab, which is where you can get Duik and simply hit download. All right. So we can have that installed for next week. The tutorial that I posted for you guys. Um, uh, video. Oh, it doesn't seem. Yeah. Okay. I gave you guys the the tutorial, the installing new Basil, so you can just follow that. All right. Cool. So taking a look at what we're going to look at today, some body mechanics. Um, when it comes to character animation, all of a sudden, and this is going to be a big jump for you guys, but the pre-production phase becomes um, of tantamount importance. All right. So when it comes to the planning, when it comes to the asset creation, the planning in terms of what is going to move when and how, uh, what is going to be visible, what isn't, that is all going to be um, very important factors to take into account. All right, which is why I'm going to give you guys the rigs to begin with. Uh, Alistair, welcome. I'm just sort of um, giving a quick update. You're not late. You're still within that grace period. All right. Uh, sorry, not sure, Alistair. Um, Lim hierarchy. Wait, why did you pick me absent? I don't. I didn't take you absent. X. X is present. X. Oh. Yeah. No, I'm Jacques. Oh, uh, you Jacques. Sorry, I thought I saw Alistair come in. Oh, I did. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I still but Cool. There we go. Jacques, you are here. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So. <clears throat> When we talk about hierarchy, what we are talking about both in terms of the layer uh, system inside of our software, as well as just in terms of the human body, we always talk about the extremity of the limb first. All right, so this is at the top of the chain, and this is because if we ignore the fingers, right, so if we just have the hand, um, when the hand moves, nothing else moves with it. Right, so that's going to be the top of our chain. Hand is attached to forearm, forearm to upper arm, so this is now going down the chain, moving towards the torso, all right? So if we take a look at our presentation here, you'll see we take a look at the extremities moving closer towards the torso. Does anyone want to take a guess what like the major driving force of movement is in the human body? Like what part of the human body drives every other sort of thing on the human body? Um, the torso. Almost, almost. What's the torso attached to? Because of the spine. To the head. The spine, but the spine comes down to the hips, right? So if you sort of put your hands on your hips, you can still bend yourself from side to side without moving your hips. Move your hips, everything else moves with it, right? Dancing's all in the hips, which is a lesson I still need to learn. Um, next, we have the torso, as I've said, and then it comes down into the hips. All right. So at the end of the day, every limb chain is going to end at the hips. All right. Uh, the hips will typically be the only layer um, in terms of like the body parts that is not parented to something else, unless there is, of course, like a null that's busy driving it. Okay. So as long as it all comes down to the hips, we're good. Okay, so within a biped, the limb chain is, as I've said, parented from the uh, tip of the limb to where it eventually attaches to the torso of the pelvis. And there are two methods when it comes to animating. All right, so I think I mentioned them last week, FK and IK, forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. Um, I think if I did mention them, I swapped the two around by accident. So forward kinematics, just to give a quick breakdown, is where we focus on um, the correct rotation of our assets or our limbs all right so if you think about it in terms of where our anchor points would be you'll see that we've been uh we've given you guys like the little white circles which is where we're going to place our anchor points and after effects uh, i see the stream is slightly behind if it sort of cuts out if you sort of can't see anything that i'm doing 
then just give me a shout so I can make sure not to uh, leave you behind. All right. But essentially, forward kinematics is just the process of working with each of our assets in uh, essentially at tandem and work with the rotation values at their joints. All right. Inverse kinematics is what we'll be using when we take a look at DOIC itself. All right. So I see we haven't updated to that. But essentially, what uh, inverse kinematics is, we build a skeleton for our assets. All right. I'll explain uh, sort of like that process a little bit further in a moment. But once we have created that skeleton, we get a little controller at the end of the limb. All right. So you can see here that that's in our hand. And when we move that controller, it is going to move everything else uh, sort of from that point. So think of it as like a marionette stream. All right. Or like a puppet with a stick for a hand. Right. Wherever I move that hand, the rest of the arm is going to go. OK. Uh, and that is the end of our presentation. All right. So hopefully you guys have downloaded the files uh, that are placed here. We're going to be taking a look at the arm.ai file. Okay. So this is the one that we're going to be um, opening up in Illustrator first and then in After Effects after that. Okay. So is there anyone who doesn't have uh, the file open in Illustrator at the moment? I don't. You don't. Okay, cool. We can take a few. I don't. No, I don't uh, as well. You don't. Okay, cool. That's fine. Like I said, like the, the other classes have been ending in like an hour. So we can sort of just slow everything down and take our time. Angela, is that a new nose stud? Or is that old? Ah, uh, you've muted yourself. My bad. No, I'm saying I've had it for a while, actually. Okay, I've just never noticed. It's like glinting in the light. Okay. <laughs> All right, when you guys have Sorry, read, you let me know. Yeah? Are we supposed to open Illustrator? Yeah, please. So we, we're... Um, so this term, just in terms of like introducing software, we're obviously going to be focusing on the software training of um, Duik, which is itself like a a basics course that we'll be doing the power and, and you can take it so much further which is something that i'm wanting to do in my spare time um, but i also want to introduce you guys to illustrator get you used to the kind of workflow so with the the rigs and the characters that i provide you guys with we'll always take a look at them in illustrator first we'll see what we've done with the layers and then um, we'll take it from there all right does anyone here have like any um experience with illustrator at all yes i do yes okay a cool. few people if not that's also fine um so just to give like a general layout if you want to take a look at the the presentation quickly um very similar to photoshop right so we've got all our tools on the left we've got our control panel at the top and our layers on the right okay the biggest difference between illustrator and Photoshop and um, After Effects is that our layers have sub layers inside. All right. So rather than Photoshop and After Effects, where like everything's on its own layer, um, we can go inside of our layers here and we can generate multiple assets that fall under the same grouping. All right. However, when that grouping is brought into After Effects, we will only see the major layers. So we need to make sure that we don't have anything inside of a layer, like a separate asset that needs to be animated separately to everything else. So for example, if I accidentally had my, my thumb and my forefinger on the same layer, and if I rotate one, the other one's going to rotate with it, and it's going to work in the wrong angle as opposed to like a pinching motion. All right. Um, you'll see that I've gone ahead and I have labeled my layers in terms of colors. All right. So what we can do is when it comes to our layers, we can either double click on a layer name. We can do that on our sub layers as well and relabel them. And if we double click on the little thumbnail, you'll see that we get layer options over here. And I can then label with a bunch of different tags. All right. So I've labeled all the assets that are referring to the arm on the left. Right, so if we just cancel that, boom. All the arms on the left are labeled green, all the arms on the right are labeled red. This way, sending this file to you guys or sending this file to like a, a work colleague or whatever, they can very quickly see what everything relates to. 
Okay. Very important at this stage. So sort of like consider this the second phase of production. First one is your like ideation phase, sketching on paper or doing some rough digital illustrations, whatever your workflow is. Um, here we break down the assets that we know are going to be animated and we start setting up their layers in such a way that it's going to make our lives easier in After Effects. All right. So again, you'll see that typically the tips of our fingers Right, you'll see that they are sitting at different areas in the layers, but they're always sitting above the layer that is the base. All right, and then at the at the very bottom, we've got the arm itself. If we just take a look at the red one. All right, so we'll be taking a look at different animation methods today. First one we're going to look at is the forward kinematics with the rotation, and then I can give you guys a very quick um, sort of demonstration, or we can do it in class, actually. The other classes didn't, but they can always follow the video um, where we'll just introduce some puppet pins, give you guys an, an idea of how that works. All right. So <clears throat> essentially, once we have done all of this process here, uh, and we're certain that everything is set up the way it needs to be, and we've labeled everything correctly, we can then dive into After Effects. All right, and I'm going to show you guys how we go about generating uh, or importing our files and then animating. All right. Uh, don't close Illustrator. We're going to do a, just like a quick example across jumping between the two software. Um, but for now, just give me a shout as soon as your After Effects is open or who's still busy with After Effects. That's my question. No one. Okay, cool. So last term, we made our assets inside of After Effects. Um, that's a habit that we should really get used to. Biggest reason being that um, the current trend in motion design is to create uh, sort of stylized paths inside of After Effects and to animate using that, whereas before it used to be my preferred style, nice flat or gradiated assets created in Illustrator. So I need to catch up. But I'll be teaching the Australian method just for now. Okay. Um, all right. So there's a few methods we can go about um, following to, to import our files. All right. The first one, obviously, the easiest one is simply to go file. You'll find import towards the middle of the screen here, and we can go to file. All right. So here's where I'll navigate to wherever my Illustrator file is. All right. And like I've said, the prep work is very important when it comes to this. So make sure that not only have you layered everything correctly inside of Illustrator, but when you're setting up your work files, always make sure that you're setting them up um, with the idea that you're not going to be moving. You're like, uh, don't, for example, don't save the arm.ai file to your desktop and then try and move it later. All right, and I'll explain why in a moment. So it's always a good idea to set up a folder uh, if I were to set this one up correctly, you'll see I've got references, After Effects, save files, and then just some, some more GIFs, all right? But if I were to set this up correctly, I would create a new folder here for assets. I'd have all my Illustrator files in that. I would have renders so that I could always render to that. And this folder would essentially be the entire project, which I would obviously make backups of as necessary. But yeah, nice and encapsulated. Okay. Taking a look, mine's called ARM class examples because I accidentally messed the original ARM file up earlier uh, yesterday. Um, but once we have selected the file itself, the next option we need to make sure to uh, just check is the import as option. All right, very important. Try and make a note of this. When we import our footage, we never bring it in as footage. All right, or very seldom do we do that. What happens when we bring it in as footage is it essentially flattens the entire file. Right, so it turns all the layers into a single one, and we're not going to be able to animate that. All right, so we always want to go for the second option, which is composition retain layer sizes. What this means is it's going to bring everything into our composition and After Effects exactly where it's placed inside of Illustrator. If you bring it in as uh, a composition without retaining layer sizes, what usually happens is all the layers get like centered automatically and they get stacked on top of each other. So Composition retain layer sizes open, and then we can take a look once the stream catches up. You guys will notice that once you've imported it, something has changed inside of your project panel. 
right? It will have brought in, uh, let me just make a folder here and call uh, for the other classes work. Dump these away, okay. So we're taking a look at the ARM class here and these layer files, all right? So when we bring in a file, it automatically creates a composition for us, all right? And all I need to do is simply double click on that composition in the project panel, and it will open it up inside of After Effects exactly the way it should be, all right? You'll see that our layers are set up in the exact same way they are in Illustrator. Okay, if I can just move that. Um, and once we've opened that and you've double clicked on the composition to go inside, what we can do is just quickly click on the background, scroll down to the very bottom layer and lock that layer so we don't accidentally interact with that. Okay, cool. Taking a look at just these layers over here. All right, these layers are not to be interacted with. Okay, take note, we do not work with these layers. We don't select them and drag them in because again, if that's what we do, they get dumped on top of each other in the incorrect order um, and then it's a nightmare to work with. Okay, these layers are here for After Effects to look at. So essentially it is saying, cool, these are all the layers that have been imported they refer to the information inside of this composition and they make sure that everything is retained correctly. All right, so essentially it's just a referencing. So how After Effects works, I think I've explained it in the past, but just to refresh, um, it's similar to placing a linked file in Photoshop. All right, we're not putting it inside of the project. Uh, what we are doing is we're saying, after Effects, follow this path. So reference the, the file inside of this folder, which is that file. Um, and if I try and copy that file, if I try to, for example, let me just jump across here. Let me rename the file if I can. All right, so let's say that's all, let's copy it across quickly. So let's put it in uh, just in a new folder, all right? Um, so what happens when I move the folder Right, all of a sudden in After Effects, it's going to give me missing file footage and it looks scary as fuck. All right, yeah, I see the eyebrows rise. It's terrifying. If you get this, like, if you don't know what the fuck is happening, your heart stops. All right, but you'll notice inside of the layers here that all of a sudden After Effects can't find what it's looking for. Okay, because I've moved that file into another folder, which is why it's very important we set everything up in our filing system correctly at first. All right, so we don't want to relabel anything. We don't want to be moving any of it. Thankfully, this is fixable, all right? So even if all of this had been animated, it doesn't lose that information. It just doesn't know what it's showing anymore, okay? So what I really need to do, and I do have a tutorial on the channel that goes about replacing missing footage, but all I need to do is go to replace. I can go to my file wherever I've moved it, and I can say, oh, here's the file, all right? Just reference everything according to this one. I don't need to re-bring it in as composition or anything like that. I'm simply pointing towards After Effects. And you can see here that some of my pinkies, for some reason, I might need to go and replace these um, manually, like so. And we're just going to choose a layer here, and we'll say pinky three. Um, all right, so yeah, I have now <laughs> nice and broken everything. So <coughs> excuse me. I will just quickly delete all of this and I can just simply bring it in and I can show you another import method. All right, so another way we can go about importing a file is by double clicking inside of our project panel. Um, that will then also bring up the, uh, the option there and I can again choose composition 10 layer sizes. Alternatively, I can drag the file in. All right, so whatever like your, your work preference is, let me just grab this one here, drag it in. Here, you'll see we've got a slightly different interface. This is simply because we're now inside of After Effects itself, and I want to import it as a composition, and I want to change it down to layer size. So again, the exact same settings, just two different buttons. We'll say OK, and dive into that composition. All right. Good so far. No questions. Cool. The next step that we're going to do, so just sort of taking a look, let's lock that background again. To make our um, lives a lot simpler, 
what we are going to do is we are now going to uh, label the colors inside of um, After Effects. So unfortunately, that doesn't um, move across from Illustrator. Uh, we don't get those color tags. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to quickly, we're going to be working on the arm here on the left. All right. So I'm just going to grab the pinkies or like the, the furthest points um, of the fingers. All right. And I'll just quickly click on the color tag here and I'm just going to make those purple. All right. The rest of them, so the base of the fingers, uh, the thumb, and then the forearm and the arm top. I'll just make those orange. All right. So the reason why I've separated the, the sort of like the, the, the far points of the fingers from the bases is just to break up the solid block of color. All right. So that um, is just to help me navigate those files. All right. So we're not going to need the arm on the right just yet. And you'll see that that refers to all those layers. But just because we're not going to use it straight away does not mean that we can skimp out on the prep work. So I'm going to select all of those fingertips. I'll label them a different color. So I'm just going to go with yellow. And then if you really don't like yellow, I'm going to go for something a little bit different. OK, so now these are set up. And when I get to this, we are going to be ready for animation. OK. However, because we don't need them, we don't necessarily want those layers just taking up real estate in our timeline. All right. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the eye off for that. All right. So now it's not going to be on screen. It still exists, but there's nothing for us to accidentally interact with. All right. The next thing that I'm going to do is directly to the right of the name of the layer. You'll see that we've got that little mushroom figure, right? So we've taken a look at making layers shy before. So I'm simply just going to click on that little button. When the stream catches up, you'll see that the little figure or the mushroom drops below the ground. All right, or the little line. Uh, and what that means is I've made this layer shy. So you can see here in the stream that I've only got like the little tip of the head sticking out. It's kind of like a diglet. All right. Uh, and then lastly, just to get rid of these, I can then click on the apply shy at the top of my timeline here. And when I click on that, it will turn blue and my layers will disappear. All right. So they still exist. They're just not visible. We all on the same page. Somewhat. Okay, cool. Yes. Yes. Dope. Um, okay, so the next phase in our planning, like I said, the planning is probably what's going to take some of the most time simply because we're not used to it. But what now needs to happen is we need to move our anchor points into the correct position and we're going to test every step we go. The reason why we're going to test, and I'm not even going to show an example because it's an absolute nightmare and an absolute shit show, but if we mess up any of these phases, um, here now, in terms of the forward kinematics, very simple to fix. Uh, we can always just go and adjust our keyframes or go back and change where the anchor point is if we've made a mistake. But when we generate um, skeletons inside of Duik, if we do not get this step right, if we do not get each of the preparatory steps right, we're going to find out however long it takes you to rig. So like an hour later, maybe 30 minutes into the animation, that your rig is useless that you're not going to be able to animate and it is a heartbreaking moment. All right. So what I want you all to do, please dive inside, grab your uh, pan behind tool. Shortcut for that is Y, if we remember. And on the upper arm layer, I'm going to place the anchor point in that white circle and that's going to act as my shoulder. Selecting my lower arm, I'm going to move my anchor point into the elbow. All right, and then the fingers we're going to treat exactly as we would with our presentation. So we've got knuckles and that is where our rotation takes place. So just moving the anchor point of the fingertips, they don't have to be in the corner. We just wanna make sure the anchor point sits at the knuckle so that when we rotate the finger, 
we don't have it rotating from like a random position in space. Okay. Now the next step here is to go about testing everything. So you can either do this while you're moving your anchor point, or you can do this later down the line. But what I'm going to do is now I'm going to grab every single piece and I'm going to rotate it. All right. And very important this step because it's going to give us an exact idea of uh, sort of just making sure that everything is working. All right. So my thumb is there. This thumb is a little off. That's fine. Uh, and this is, like I said, just making sure that for the skeleton, we're not going to have any issues later down the line. Okay. Cool. Have we all moved our anchor points? Are we still busy with that? No one? Great. Have we all tested? All right. The test. Do not skimp on the test. Make it a habit. Like I said, fucking this up will... Uh, screwing this up is going to cost you later down the line. All right. So the next thing is we are going to parent our layers correctly. Okay. So what I tend to do is just start at the bottom, right? So this is our limb hierarchy, as I've said. So from the bottom moving upwards is us moving along our limb chain towards the extremities. So I know that my upper arm is not going to be attached or parented to anything. Moving up the line, my forearm is going to be parented to the layer below, which is the arm top. So I'm going to use that little pick whip tool, and I'm just going to drag and drop over the arm top. Okay. The fingers that are labeled with one, so that's thumb one, index one, middle one, and pinky one, all of those can be moved to the forearm. They can be parented to the forearm. All right. And then the corresponding numbers, so pinky two, for example, will be parented to pinky one. Okay, so nice and simple. This is where labeling becomes very important. If you guys can imagine working with layers that are just layer one, layer two, layer three, this would be a bit of a bit of a shit experience. Okay. Then it's okay if you're still busy doing that. The next phase is again another test. All right, so I'm going to make sure that the parenting is working correctly. So when I move my forearm, my fingers move, but my upper arm does not. All right, my fingertips will work. Um, you don't have to like hit R and go into the rotation. We have the rotation tool at the top of the screen. Shortcut for that is W, just in case you guys don't know. I can check there. My fingertips are working. The base of my fingers when I rotate those will then move my fingertips. All right, and once I know that my rig is working, I can then begin to animate. All right, we all good so far. Is anyone still busy? Um, I'm unable to kind of do both at the same time because I'm on my laptop at the moment. So kind of like switching no, between. Sure. I do, I have another computer downstairs. I just can't Google Meet on it or like speak because it has no like sound system, but I can maybe take my laptop down there and then kind of work on both for next time. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So you'll see I'm, I'm presenting from like one machine and then yeah. calling off of another. So you guys are welcome to do that. Even if you just like do the call off of your phone, obviously watching the tutorial might be a little bit hard, um, but at least you'll have like that yeah. information there. Okay. Um, is there anything that I need to re-explain? Did you miss no, anything? No, 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 that's okay kind of understanding what's going on at the moment so that's cool good 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 Thank you. all right all right now we can actually work on the animation oh that's such a bad idea um so what we're going to be working with is we're going to break this down the best way to eat an elephant is to uh, just take it one bite at a time okay so i'm just going to quickly import the reference file that we're going to be taking a look at. So you'll see on the classroom that I did also give you, I gave you a, a rigging methods video. All right. So this just gives you an idea that the difference between two different softwares, which is Duik and Rubber Hose. All right. Rubber Hose is kind of industry standard at the moment, but unfortunately it's, it's a little bit pricey. Um, whereas uh, Duik is completely free. All right. Uh, the next video is called week two dash IK underscore FK. And if we take a look at that, 
that is giving us the example of um, how our motion is going to work. So you'll see we've got like a little bit of a snap motion going on. Okay, so I'm going to import this the same way that you guys are going to be bringing in your video files. Um, we can bring it in as footage, right? If we make a project, it's going to make an entirely new project out of, uh, out of this. So we would exit and have to save this one. So I'm just going to say, okay, and it will make its own composition, as I said. And now I can scrub through this as necessary to see what happens. All right. So what I'm going to do to make my life easier, as I said, is I'm going to start with the upper arm and then I'll move to the forearm and then finally I'll do the fingers. All right. So layer by layer. And just for um, just to give you guys like an idea of how we go about doing this, for example, is I'm going to draw a mask. I'll introduce you guys to masks uh, next term, maybe later at the end of the term. And I'm just going to create like a cutout so that all I see here is just the rotation of that upper arm. All right. So if I scrub through here, I can see that it moves up, it moves down, and then it comes back to rest after a small like overshoot back up. Okay. So I am going to turn off everything that is not my upper arm simply by clicking the eye. I'll grab this and hit R for my rotation and I can create a keyframe for that. And I'm going to position it sort of at a 45 degree angle so that I can start my motion from there. Okay, so yeah, you guys can follow along with that. Okay, just give me a shout if you guys get left behind and know jumping back and forth between the two is a bit of a mission. Um, <clears throat> So I don't necessarily want to block out according to the seconds anymore. That's kind of just because in this motion, uh, it's not uniform. It's a little bit easier for me to kind of just get the timing right to begin with. Uh, but we can obviously always move our keyframes. All right. So I think, yeah, let's do that as an exercise for everyone. We'll jump to keyframe number one or second number one rather. And I am going to animate my arm rising right here a little bit of an exercise in subtlety we don't want it slamming too far down second number two i'm going to bring it down as i said so that's going to be that snap second number three is where we try and come to rest so i know that i came to rest at 45 degrees but i want to overpass that point slightly make that like 47 degrees and then our final keyframe is coming back to rest all right and if we want to make this like a little bit more interesting we don't come back to rest the exact same like position that we started we can kind of end in like a slightly different pose and we can always adjust the change in our values later down the line okay do we all have those keyframes set okay cool so now I'm going to go about moving those keyframes closer together, just to give myself a rough idea. Um, if I take a look at the footage, like I said, it sort of rises at a fairly slow pace. Obviously, the snap down is a little bit faster, and then it comes to rest at the end fairly slow as well. So this is where I kind of just start counting out keyframes. And this is how we would go about um, sort of animating within the actual pipeline. So I would say, for example, that I think that that motion takes about, uh, my key for, oh, there we go. Uh, maybe that motion takes about 10, maybe 12 keyframes. So I can simply hit Command Shift and hit my arrow key to the right on my MacBook. Otherwise, you guys can hold down uh, Shift and Control Shift and hit your page down button. That will jump you out by 10 frames. And then I'll just count out two more frames move my keyframe there all right that downward motion i'll give maybe about eight frames so i can simply just hit shift command jump out move backwards by two frames is this kind of like making sense is anyone who doesn't understand what i'm doing okay uh so that downward motion takes place slightly faster and then that upward motion again i can give maybe 12 frames all right and then the movement between the end is quite small. So I just count myself out about five, six frames. 
we'll do that and then I can end my, my composition here just so that when I play it back, it's moving. All right, so you'll see it's gonna look a little bit jagged, looks quite like unappealing, but the power of adding easy ease will fix that for us. Okay, so we'll take a look at applying easy ease in a moment. Let us just quickly animate the forearm now. All right, and then you'll see like a bigger difference in terms of the, the easy ease here. Okay, so exactly the same way that we did our ball bounce and board and tail is once we've animated the first layer, we can then um, use those as like guides where to put our next keyframes. All right. So the upper arm directly changes or animates the, the lower arm, the forearm. So we're going to have them move at exactly the same pace. And the movement is exactly the same. So when the forearm moves up, the uh, sorry, when the upper arm moves up, the forearm is going to contract slightly closer to the body. And when it moves down, it's going to move further away. All right. It's just going to be slightly more subtle. So as my arm moves up, I'll change my rotation by a little bit. Let's maybe make it like 15%, 20%. All right. As it moves down, we can take it maybe back down to zero. Let's move my rotation value into the negative range. Make that like minus 15, sticking to the same numbers. Um, here, we started off, I can simply copy and paste my beginning keyframe. Started off at zero, so I'm going to bring it slightly beyond zero. Uh, so maybe like five, six degrees of rotation, and then I'll bring it back down. Maybe bring it down to like negative five. Okay. Cool, so again, just to make sure you guys are like aware of what it is that I'm doing. All right, no, no one getting left behind, fantastic. Okay, so once you've done those two motions, what you can do is you can just select all of those keyframes and you can apply easy ease to those and you should see that it'll be looking a lot better. Okay, so let me... Do that myself. There and there. Okay. So, yeah, that's looking a little bit better. So, the reason why I've now applied easy ease to this rather than blocking out the fingers next is because, especially for the arm, we, we know that like human movement is quite fluid, right? So, it's not all moving at exactly the same pace. Um, and our fingers are, are going to be driven by the fluidity of that motion as opposed to the mechanical sort of thing of the hands. This is kind of for this exercise, how we go about introducing a little bit of um, maybe a bit of realism, just in terms of how the fingers would work, but also a little bit of exaggeration to make it a little bit more appealing. All right, so I've applied easing to that. And then I can actually lock my forearm and uh, upper arm layers so I don't actually work with those. And I can turn all my fingers back on. Okay, now again, I'm going to use my keyframes as reference for where my fingers keyframes would be, but I'm going to shift them up by a couple of frames later down the line, just so that it's not all happening at once. Okay, so here, I suppose, as long as I'm working with all the fingers at once, because uh, obviously the thumb rotates in a separate direction, right, opposite to how these fingers would rotate if we were moving forward, uh, towards the center here. So I can essentially, if I wanted to be lazy, create keyframes here, and I can sort of instantly apply easy ease to those. Um, and I can rotate them all at the same time. Right, nice simple fingers, simply by adding 15 degrees rotation to all of them, they're kind of all closing at the same uh, space. Maybe let's bring this down to about, or bring the rotation up to about 20. And then the thumb, our rotation would be in the negative values to close them in the opposite direction. All right. So if I scrub back and forth, you'll see now that my fingers close slightly. I might want to now start adjusting their individual rotation. Uh, so I'll start off with, for example, the index base. Uh, let's bring that a little bit closer there. 
the thumb I can bring forward a little bit. So here, just some general tweaking after I've got the basic idea of what I want the fingers to look like. Try and leave a gap between the fingers so that they don't overlap. I've just found from experience that they look a little bit strange when, uh, when the fingers overcross each other just because they're not different shades. All right, we all good so far. Cool, not hearing any complaints. I'm, I'm really happy so far. All right, so <clears throat> if we take a look at our video footage, if you guys are sort of running through, you'll see that our fingers actually close only really as the hand starts moving down. All right. We can always adjust this in terms of our graph editor, which is going to be um, fairly simple to do. Um, but we can just take a look at what they do in terms of moving upwards. So if I were to just quickly grab, uh, I haven't been animating my thumbs. Oh, dumbass. Always animate the thumbs. Uh, so let me just quickly fix that. So that's there. Let's bring it back to rest. So that would both be zero. All right, cool. So that now closes. Uh, that moves as the arm goes down. So what I can do is I can just select all of my keyframes for my fingers and I'm gonna drag them up so that they essentially overlap with this section here. So I can actually shift this up a little bit. Again, this is where our graph editor would come in handy. Uh, just to make sure that our fingers are closing at the correct time. But for now, it's looking pretty decent. Okay. As my hand moves upwards, we want the fingers to open. All right. We don't necessarily need to bring them all back to 0%, but just to sort of for the sake of brevity, let me bring them to zero. Uh, and then I can actually push them in the opposite direction just to get them to open slightly further. So I can push the thumb. The thumb's a little bit difficult um, just because it only has, well, I mean, like we know for a fact it only has those two digits as opposed to three, even though we're only animating two. I don't know, I'm rambling. I think it's making sense. Um, so I can open that up slightly wider as the movement takes the fingers up. And then as we come down to rest, this is when I can bring them all to zero. So we've overshot and now we're coming to rest. And if I play that back, I've got a fairly decent representation of our footage. Obviously, stream doesn't want to show it, but yeah, it's looking fairly okay. Um, and then the next part would be jumping into the graph editor and just fixing up the motion so that our fingers um, so we close at the right time. We can also then adjust the, the actual rotation of the upper arm and the forearm. Um, yeah, are you guys ready to do that? Just take a quick squiz of what it would look like inside of the graph editor. Um, so because the, the upper arm and the forearm move at exactly the same rate, we can select those keyframes together all right, and then move into the graph editor because whatever we do to the one, we're going to do to the other. All right, so I'm going to right click here, just make sure I'm editing my speed graph, not my value graph. Okay, and here we can just run through the motion. So as it goes up, uh, that's going to start slightly slower. All right, so let me just zoom in here so we can see. Um, so we're going to just shift the arcs slightly. We don't want to snap, right? We don't want the arm to to really uh, snap, even though it does kind of actually match the motion. So let's take a look at what we can do here. Um, we'll bring in the snap like so. Uh, and I've explained to you guys in the past, but uh, when we start getting to this sort of level of animation at this stage, it really is just having a good understanding of the software, right? So which direction am I going to pull the peaks of my speed graph? Um, and then playing around with it. All right, so my arm comes up slightly overshoots here. Again, because it's moving in the opposite direction, it is going to have to overcome that momentum. And I kind of wanted to slow down a little bit, right? Because the obviously like the, the, the force involved is slowing down the motion of the arm coming to rest. So if I play this back, yeah, it's a little snappy. 
could probably stand to just even out some of these curves a little bit. Um, they don't have to be peaked, just enough to apply a bit of subtlety to the motion. Let's drag that out there, maybe soften this up here. And this is, yeah, this is motion design. One day you'll either be freelancing with a cat on your lap or you'll be chilling in a studio with a cup of free coffee and you're just going to be staring at lines. But you'll be working on cool shit. So, you know, don't let that bother you. Okay, so I'm happy with my arm. What I want to do next is work on the fingers. Now, again, because the fingers are doing the exact same motion, right? They're all involved in the same action. We can work in the graph editor with all of their values at once. Okay, so here I don't necessarily want, uh, like the easy ease is kind of doing the job for me, right? We're getting that nice subtle motion on the fingers. Um, I think my movement on my upper arm at the end is a bit much, but you can always fix that. Oh, it's a forearm, that rotation is there. That rotation is there. And then it comes down to 37. So let's make that 40. Okay. So yeah, we can always go back and adjust our, our values later down the line. But at the moment, it's kind of looking fairly decent. And then the last thing I'm going to do is just here at the end, you'll see that my finger, uh, my finger keyframe starts about one frame. To like later down the timeline than the arm itself, I might push that to two frames. And then again, at the end, uh, one or two frames, very subtle. We don't want them like lagging in behind everything else. Um, but yeah, you might find that the opening of the fingers here needs to happen a little bit faster. Uh, so let's jump into the graph editor here. And let's just pull these out a little bit. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, it's working a little bit better. So this again is kind of where we need to start understanding the actual motion, right? So I'm giving you guys the design, we're obviously focusing on the motion involved. Um, this is where our reference sort of comes in handy, right? The more accurate our reference, the better. Um, so we'll sort of just discuss that after the class. But for now, it's just simply applying, right? We know that overlapping action, things look a little bit better when it doesn't all happen at once. We apply the easing so that it doesn't sort of like, again, all happen at once. Um, just layer by layer, refining until it's as good as we can get it um, with the deadline in mind. Okay, are we ready to move on to the other arm? I just want to do a quick demonstration of the puppet pin tool. All good. Cool. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll just hit Command or Control A to select all of them. And I can either click the little drop down to collapse them or I can hit U. To collapse them, remember U is the shortcut to bring up all the keyframes on a layer. Hitting U will collapse them as well. Okay, so we're done with this arm. We don't necessarily, or we, we don't need to work with it any further. So with all of those layers selected, I'm going to lock them. And I'm just going to turn off my little shy button here uh, and turn the eyes back on for my other arm. So I can see that. Okay. Um, so now I want this arm's layers in my timeline. So I'm going to just unshy them. I can simply do that by clicking and dragging down over those little mushroom buttons. And then I can apply shy to my top arm. Thankfully, or the, the arm we've just worked on. Thankfully, the shy button works regardless of whether the layer is locked or not. And I'm going to turn on the shy feature. I can even make my background shy. And there we go. Now we've got all the layers. Cool. Who remembers what we need to do with this face? But how do we, what, what, what's our work progress from here? What do we do? Where do we go? No, I'm brave enough. That's fine. Okay. Um, I'm going to guess if I remember correctly, you have to test the anchor points or is that only a bit later? 
second step. So we need to okay. move the points to the correct position first, right? Okay. Uh, so awesome. let's zoom in here. So for this arm, you'll see that the arm itself is a single layer. Um, so we're going to move that anchor point again to where the shoulder would be. All right, just because we're working with an arm solo now doesn't mean we wouldn't attach it to a character letter. Uh, and I'm just I'm going to test like as I go, just to make my life a little bit faster here. Um, but again, just moving my anchor points to where they need to be. Exactly the same way we would do the other fingers. Uh, so if we wanted to be lazy here, because essentially the exercise would be to animate um, exactly the same sort of reference, although you'll only be animating the forward kinematics this week in terms of the rotation here, rather than using the public fin tool. Um, cool. Grab all my fingers, adjust their rotation so I can see that they're working great and their anchor points in the right place. Cool. What's the next step? Now it's testing the anchor points. Uh, yes, testing the anchor points, right? So this is where we do the rotation. And then we can move on to the parenting as well. All right. Works exactly the same way. Um, all the layers labeled one, so that's pinky one, middle one, um, index one, and thumb one, those can be parented to the arm. The arm is not going to be parented to anything at all. And then the tips of our fingers, we will parent to their respective bases. Okay. All good so far? Hope so. Okay, so <clears throat> the next step is we would now, let me introduce you to, although uh, it's going to be a bit of a mission. Let me see, I haven't done this method in a while. Let me introduce you quickly to the public pin tool and we'll see if it works or not. Okay, so the public pin tool is the very last tool we have at the top left. It literally looks like a little thumbtack, all right? And we're going to be using the public pin tool um, as a method inside of Duik, all right, we change a couple of the core settings. Um, so what we want to do is, I just want to open up my properties panel. So I'm going to win, go to window. Uh, let me just make sure that my effect controls is on. So if you don't see a, an effect controls next to your project over here, we can go to window. We're going to turn on effect controls, which is towards the bottom here, directly under composition. And that's going to open up effects here. So this is where we'll see our public pin. All right. So with my pin, again, I'm just going to simply move from the furthest point or the, the closest point to the torso away. And I'm just going to click inside of each of these little circles. And you'll see that when I do, we get little yellow circles uh, sort of chilling there in the center. All right. All good so far. Cool. So you'll see on the arm layer, now that we've clicked with our public pin, if I hit U quickly, you'll see that it has made some keyframes for me automatically. So I'm just going to shift those back to the start. Uh, and if I take a look at the names, you'll see that those are labeled as public pin one, two, and three. All right. So we may sometimes work with about five or six puppet pins on a layer um, because the pins also allow us to lock like corners into position so that the whole thing doesn't bend. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to relabel these now. Again, the prep process, very important. So position one, you'll see that by, by creating your anchor points from the torso outwards, the puppet pins that are created will then layer upwards. Right, so the top of the layer will be the top of your limb hierarchy and uh, sort of furthest away from the body and then vice versa. So my public pin one, I'm just going to call shoulder. Uh, public pin two, I'll call elbow. And then we will have the wrist essentially. All good? Cool. So. The cool thing now is if you sort of click and drag, you'll see that you can now bend your form, which is pretty sick, right? You'll see that our, our edges aren't looking very smooth. I'm going to show you how we would go about affecting that in a moment. So with our public pin tool selected, 
you'll see that I have some options to the immediate right of that. The first one is show mesh. If you click that on, let me try and change this color to something you'll see a little bit better. Um, so with my mesh selected, um, you'll see that it, it essentially breaks everything down into triangles, very similar as, as like 3D as far as I understand it. Um, and you'll see next to that, we have expansion and density. All right, now these options refer to the advanced version of the Puppet Pin tool. And you can see that in your effect controls here next to your project panel, you'll see that our Puppet engine is set to advanced. All right, when working with Duik, we always wanna click that drop down and just set to legacy. Okay, make note of this step. A lot of people forget to do this. Again, if you don't do this step before you start generating your, your um, skeleton and all of that, it's gonna break your rig and it's not going to work. All right, so you'll see as soon as I have set it to legacy and I reselect one of my pins, my options at the top here are slightly different. It still says expansion, and the further I pull that expansion out, the further it's going to push the boundaries. Let me maybe just turn off the background. Can we see a bit better? Kind of, right? You can see that my expansion is moving outwards. Maybe this is where we need like a, a neon green. Let's see. Um, Hopefully, yeah, there we go. So the expansion is just moving that mesh outwards, all right? And that allows us to kind of like smooth our edges a little bit. I'm gonna bring that back down to three. Um, the same way with our keyframes, we don't wanna push the parameters further than we need to because they're taxing our machine more, all right? Because of this deformation, what we've essentially done is we've told After Effects, keep this um, sort of like, uh, how would I explain this? Um, if you take a look at my, my bounding box, right, you'll see that if I hover over it, it's still technically a square, right? So I haven't changed the asset. I've just changed the way that After Effects is seeing it. Um, I can smooth out that change by changing the number of triangles. So if I change my triangles down to, let's make that like 10, maybe like, <laughs> uh, so we get like a very weird Tim Burton kind of vibe. Um, so the more triangles I have, the better in terms of smoothing, All right? And there's no real sort of like go-to number for me, but I don't want to push this to like 9,000, right? Because I don't need that many triangles. I don't need it to be that smooth. And the more triangles I have, the more work After Effects needs to put in when I'm animating that deformation because it needs to track each of those little triangles. You'll see that my machine is actually really struggling at this point um, to even load that number of triangles. So let's just drop that down to like, when I can, I've made the mistake, right? Uh, so let's just drop that down to about 350 for now. Okay, cool. Um, so <clears throat> this was just a brief introduction to the Puppet Pool uh, tool. I wasn't planning on showing that to you guys today, so I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to show you how we would go about animating the digits with that. Um, let me just, yeah, go back and, and make sure. But I have covered these in a tutorial that I'll link in the video as well. Um, so you can sort of just follow through with that. Okay. Uh, and that is an introduction to forward kinematics. Any questions? None. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to ask. Yeah. For creating like a whole animation, like everything, how long do you think that'll take us roughly? We've got the whole term to do it. So long. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's going to be a learning curve. So once we take a look at Duik, we're going to spend the entirety of next week looking at Duik and how we go about applying it uh, and how we, we make inverse kinematics. Um, once we get a little bit more familiar with Duik and, and we have the entire process written out that you can follow step by step, um, what you can do is it, it'll obviously become faster. Um, the prep work won't take you any time at all because I'll be providing you with the correct files. So you'll dive straight into animation. Um, and that in itself is, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to take a little while, okay, but cool. uh, it should be fun, hopefully. If you guys hate it, then, uh, then I don't know. I'm excited. I think it's going to be cool. So this is why I took motion design, character animation. Literally, I decided to to major in motion design the minute my lecturer introduced the puppet tool to me. It's like, 
mind blown. <laughs> Back in the day when it was still CS6, none of this advanced legacy bullshit. All right. Um, cool. So with that, uh, if we don't have any questions, we can then just quickly address like the video footage and stuff uh, on Classroom. So I'm really digging like the files. I haven't taken a look at today's yet, but I will give feedback now after class. Um, the, the major problems that are cropping up, there are two. The first one um, is acting. All right, so if you guys just sort of like look at the, at the presentation for now. Um, so the first one is acting, right? And this typically happens when you guys find something heavy, so like a couch or a bed or uh, a pot plant or something, um, but you don't physically try to interact with it. You kind of like try to act to show that you can't move it. So what I want you to do is if you have done that, re-record, but really give it your all. Find something heavier. All right, we're exaggerating. We're not acting for this. Um, the other thing is that getting some great footage, but the camera angle is going to make it difficult for you to animate. All right, so there's there's technically no wrong camera angle. Right? As long as you get the entire motion, you're fine. But to make this uh, as easy as possible, what we're going to do is again make sure that your camera is 45 degrees on from the front. All right, a lot of people are getting some good pushing motion, but they're going three, uh, three quarter from the back. All right, our character is not like this, so we're not going to be animating like this. Um, if you're struggling to get that pose, change what you're working with, find the corner of your house outside, push that. You can get the 45 degree angle against the 90 degree angle of the walls, um, 45 degree angle of the walls, rather. Um, yeah, so sort of just like make sure that you've done that, and then after the feedback, you can resubmit uh, and sort of take it from there. All right. Um, so for next week, what I want you guys to do in terms of homework assignment, I'm going to post that for everyone now. Um, I want you to use that week two video footage as reference. All right. Take the ARM file, prep it. You, I mean, you've done all of that now. Just practice animating it, essentially. Uh, so animate it from scratch if you can. Um, and then I'll post that tutorial, and you guys can sort of just follow along for the puppet pin tool. Um, and we can take a look at that later down the line as well. Okay, are there any questions? Well, good, cool. Then I think we can call it there. If you guys are fine with that, uh, I can stick around if there are any questions, but otherwise I'm gonna end the recording here um, and then we can yeah, either leave now or take it as it comes. <laughs>